present-day Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire or Ivory Coast. People have been living in this part of West Africa from about 30 to 40,000 years ago. We know this from fossil evidence. Fast forward to the 13th century and several kingdoms had come into being famed for their use and sale of gold. The most powerful of these was the Asante. In this episode, we see how the Asante remained deeply attached to their traditions and culture, even in the face of adversity and conquest, and how women were in the forefront of their battles for survival. The Asante are one of the best known of Africa's groups. They're sometimes called the Ashanti, and their history accounts for some of the most vivid chapters in Africa's story, as described in UNESCO's General History of Africa, on which this series bases its facts. We'll see how they fought bitterly and bravely, their rulers enduring long periods of exile in order to maintain their proud traditions. First, who exactly are the Asante? Well, they belong to a much larger community known as the Akan, who make up about 45% of the population of modern-day Ghana and around 33% of Côte d'Ivoire. The Akan include many other subgroups like Twi and Fanti in Ghana and the Baule and Abron in Côte d'Ivoire. To get an impression of the mix of these ethnicities, I go to the Asmira restaurant in the Ghanaian capital Accra, which prides itself on serving a wide variety of dishes. Local fashion designer Linda Amper, her husband Carl and daughter Naurama helpfully take me through what's on offer. Every region is represented in this restaurant. Uh -huh. So, what, oh my, this is a huge. What is this that's just So, presented? this is called Impotom Potom. This is from the eastern region of Ghana mm. and it's made from cocoa. This one is Kontomre stew. This is typical of Ashanti and also Ekwapim and Achim. So it's really the Akan food. That's Banku. Oh, this is Banku. Oh, I'm getting my food for my Banku. This one is from the Volta region of Ghana. What's this sauce here? It's hot pepper sauce. And what is this name? Shito. Um, Shito. It's called Shito. I'm glad it's got an O on the end of it. <laughs> It'd yeah. be a problem if it didn't. Uh, you know? <laughs> <laughs> The populations of what are today Ghana and Côte d'Ivoire most likely originally came from the Lake Chad region in stages over the centuries, across the Niger River and then through present-day Benin and Togo. Dr. Gavua lectures at the University of Ghana, which maintains a small museum of archaeology in its grounds. No community has been static. There has been migrations across the territory over a long period of time due to environmental changes, due to warfare, due to trade, commerce of various kinds, intra-regional, inter-regional trade. People have been moving up and down over a long period of time. That is why today, to some of us, uh, the events of our history makes no sense of ethnicity of tribalism uh, because we have been mixing and remixing over a long period of time. So as Dr. Gavua points out, although the Asante are one of the best defined groups in Africa today, they are in fact the product of much mixing over the centuries. At first, they lived by hunting animals and gathering wild fruit and berries. Then in time, they began to settle. For those who chose dense forest areas, there were particular challenges. By about 600, these hunter foraging communities also began to farm and live in villages. But before they could begin farming, they had to clear huge tracts of forest to create agricultural land. And this was a monumental task and it was so labor intensive. It's uh, possible that forced labor was used. Just imagine trying to hack away to bring down 
trees like this one with a pretty solid trunk. Must have taken such a long time. I get a very slight idea myself of just how hard it must have been to get around forests. We cannot tell the expanse of land that people were clearing at the time, but there's evidence to suggest that they were using polished stone axe heads to produce axes that they probably used to clear the forest. They also had uh, scrapers and uh, various tools that they could have used to cultivate. But as to the mode of cultivation at that particular time, um, we are yet to pinpoint that. But farm they did, and as well as crops, they also relied on the palm fruit tree. Even today, this is an extremely important source of food in Africa, and just about every part of the tree is used. So I've happened across this pile of palm nuts, and it's a good opportunity to tell you about the many uses that the palm tree has for the people. The palm fruit, which is this, is used in cooking and it makes a really delicious soup. The palm nut is used for oil. The trunk of the palm tree is used for the famous palm wine, which is uh, drank, you know, all over Africa. And the uh, branches of the palm tree are used in roofs, you know, for thatched huts. And I'm just going to try a bit of this one because get an idea of whether it's bitter or not. Got a slightly bitter taste, but it, it's it's really nice, quite a good specimen. So there you have it. As communities became more settled, they developed chiefdoms. Some of the bigger ones had complex social, economic and political systems like the Asante. They particularly favoured hilltop sites and established the heart of their civilization in Kumasi, about 200 kilometres northwest of modern Accra. Kumasi was located on the edge of the rainforest, which gave them access to both savanna and forest areas. I want to find out more about Asante culture, so I head to the village of Abono, about 40 kilometers outside Kumasi. Here I meet one Asante community leader, Fred Amtwi. He's invited me home to meet his family, his wife and some of his six children. His sister Frances has just got back from a long day on the farm. Fred served for many years in the Ghanaian Armed Forces, who were amongst the most active in African peacekeeping missions. Before he tells me about Asante culture, I'm curious to hear more about his time in the military. I've been to Rwanda, Cambodia, Liberia, Israel. You said Rwanda. Yes. So were you there during the genocide of 1994? Yes. Yes. Not too much long, but... And you come from a very peaceful country, Ghana. Yes, please. How did you feel as an African when you saw the suffering of the people of Rwanda? You remember me something. I become very sad. Our people are lying outside. People died, not because of the gun, but because of the food, because of the water. Running, climbing, hot hills, mountains. Your daughter or your son is crying, following you. But I must go. If we come back, maybe he can't kill you. So we saw somebody dead, crying, dead. It's very pity. After his experiences working within divided communities, Fred tells me he believes even more that communities such as his are united through a common culture and heritage. And this is one of the reasons why there's a strong bond between all Asantes. And Fred wants to take me to a nearby location that's important to his people.
It is Lake Basomtwi, which is situated within an ancient crater and is more than 10 kilometers in diameter. It's a popular spot with visitors, fishermen, and those who fancy a picnic lakeside. It's um, obviously a, a lake of great natural beauty, but it's also got huge significance culturally for the Ashanti people, yes. or as some people say, the Ashanti people. Yeah, the Ashanti. <laughs> um, tell us why that is. <laughs> well, this lake, we the Ashantis are controlling it, according to our, our forefathers. We are controlled because of the hunter who came and discovered him. But then he was thick, thick for us. And he was in making the hunting on the taboo day. The hunter hide and be to the forest. And he got missing. And a dog with him. On their way coming home, and he saw an animal, that's an antelope, for example, like a deer. He shot it. But through panic, and the bullet hit the animal. So the animal ran through the blood. And then the hunter froze. He became surprised. He became shocked. So he hid himself somewhere. And the dog started eating the fish. And that animal antelope, in our language, we call it Oxy. And then the a date, we call it possum. So we combine it together, possum, she. The steady trek of visitors to Lake Basantui keeps Fred occupied. He works as a supervisor at the site. I leave Fred to get on with his work. In the past, Asante communities like Fred's united and formed kingdoms. They became rich because they used the rivers around them, not only for fishing, for something much more valuable, gold. Rulers fully exploited the alluvial gold found in rivers, and the kings would sell this through agents as part of extensive trading networks. But their prosperity also rested on their military strength and their ability to dominate other communities. In fact, Asante means because of war, and the Asante were very good at this. Through their gold sales, Asante kings had the means to buy weapons and ammunition, which gave them a decisive edge in battle. By the 1600s, the Asante kings became the most powerful of the Akan. But it was to take another several decades before they became united into one kingdom. This was achieved by a military officer called Ose Tutu. In the 1670s, he used Kumasi as his base to conquer surrounding Akan chieftains. Bit by bit, Ose Tutu's authority grew, and this was cemented when he gained the support of religious leaders. One of these priests, Okonfo Anoche, depicted here in this statue in Kumasi, presented Ose Tutu with a stool which had fallen from the sky. And to this day, the golden stool is a symbol of Asante kingship. In 1701, Osei Tutu pronounced himself the Asantehini, which means the paramount king. His acceptance of the golden stool from the priest Okonfo Anoche meant that right from the start, this became synonymous with the Asante kingdom. The golden stool is so important to the Asante, they believe if it's ever captured or destroyed, then the Asante kingdom will disintegrate. It's rarely seen, and this is a photograph of it from recent years. Along with the Paramount King, the Asante also have an organized hierarchical structure that includes lesser kings and chiefs. Praise singers at the home in Kumasi of one of the paramount chiefs of the Asante, who serves as an advisor to the current king. 
In the grounds of his large home, he tells me the founder of the Asante Kingdom, Osei Tutu I, is highly revered. Well, back in the 17th century, uh, King Osei Tutu I and his confidant, uh, Okonfu Anochi, they came from Akwabu, somewhere around the eastern region in present-day Ghana, and came to Kumasi. When they came here, they fought. They conquered some of the people who were living in here already, and they established themselves as the supremos of this area. King Osei Tutu and uh, Okonfu Anochi uh, decided that they should get a, a, a new zoo that Osei Tutu will occupy. And Okonfu Anochi did some magic or some conjure that uh, one nice golden zoo came from the heavens and he came to sit on the lap of King Osei Tutu and King Osei Tutu became the Asante Hene. We talk about him because he's the one who established the Asante Kingdom. He fought many, many wars and conquered many, many areas. So he is the one who actually established the Ashanti Kingdom. We still talk about him. This is the reason why when uh, King Osei Tutu II took his name, a lot of us thought good things would come out from this man. The Asante Kingdom was quite a militaristic one. That's Just right. tell us a bit about how it used um, its very disciplined soldiers to expand its territories. In the beginning, King Osei Tutu and Okonfanachi came in here. They conquered a lot of people in here. And then they were able to go to the coast and buy guns. And uh, when they had guns, they thought they, the only way to use the gun well was to expand and get more lands and get more people to serve them. And so they expanded from the coast all the way from east to west of now modern day Ghana. I wonder if the paramount chief feels weighed down with all that gold. This is called cow and it's heavy because it's gold, it's solid gold. This is mostly worn by men and women. Uh, but you have to be a chief or a queen mother. And what does that denote? It's just a design. Just a design. <laughs> And is this old gold? Is it handed down from generation well, to yes, generation? Yes. How so, old is your jewelry? This is about uh, maybe 50 years. All right. Because uh, I got it from my predecessor. The Asante dress to impress, and they have a regular occasion designed for just that purpose. A chance to express one's status through clothing and jewellery. It's a ceremony called the Aquasidae. The upper echelons of the Asante Kingdom are all gathered here today for the Aquasidae, which is a special festival that takes place every 40 days. And everybody's waiting to course the Asante Hini for the start of the uh, festivals. Hear the drumming in the background, of course, and the processions coming in under their parasols, evidently, to protect themselves from the intense heat of the Kumasi sun. I wish I had one. The Aquasidae, which always takes place in Kumasi, is a celebration of Asante culture. The paramount king is seen as the bearer of a divine kingship, as local heritage expert Osei Bonsu explains. Akwasida uh, signifies a day of worshipping through our dead kings. We believe that our dead kings serve our sins between us and the Almighty God. So that Akwasida is reserved for them every 40 days, which falls on a Sunday, where prayer is said through the mentioning of the dead kings. When he's brought in, what's in the procession with him? Yeah, in the section what is coming in there is also a number of people holding shirts and displaying the shirt in the sky 
This is to show that he has thousand chills defending him. They throw the seal. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. There's a man with a headdress. So this man is carrying a cap of heart that is made up of the eagle's feathers to show the importance and the power of the Asantean. Who was the man who came in the procession with a bowl on his head? The one with a bowl on his head with heads. It is believed that uh, he has power. Every Anybody has a bad spirit within the congregation, his spirit will conquer that spirit before the assembly comes in. There was uh, also somebody carrying a bowl with a net covering that bowl. That bowl has some amount of money in gold. Uh, so that when the king needs to buy something, it is changed into normal currency that he can buy. And then the men carrying the muskets and the guns. Every one of the gun represents the gun of a past king. Every king of Ashanti is believed to be a war uh, general whose gun is kept in the museum. And so it's a movie museum. Every gun stands for one king of Ashanti. And the king sits on a wooden stool, not gold. No, the king sits on a wooden stool and balls with gold, not on the golden stool. The golden stool is not meant for anybody to sit on it. The king's button is tucked on the golden stool three times. That is the first time that he elected as a king. People hold him and the bottom is touched on the golden stool only three times. And that is for his lifetime when his bottom was Touch the good is the royal pocket. Yes, yeah. <laughs> The Asantahini is always a king, but that doesn't mean women don't matter. In the Asante royal family, power is typically inherited through the female line, what's known as the matrilineal system. And indeed, a Sandy history is littered with powerful queens. After the break, we hear the poignant story of one brave Asante queen who fled Ashantiland and set up a new kingdom in what is today Cote d'Ivoire. And how another Asante queen, through her courage and cunning, took on the British in the War of the Golden Stool. This is Cote d'Ivoire. I've come here to find out about one of the most famous of the Asante queens. I head for the museum in the main city, Abidjan, to catch up with the curator there in between his conducted tours for school children. Tagro Francis takes me back to the early 1700s when a female member of the Asante royal family called Ablapoku had a dispute over a succession and was forced to flee Ashantiland following a bitter rivalry. Tous les Akans qui se vivent en Côte d'Ivoire sont d'origine Ashanti parce que il y a eu une guerre de succession au temps du roi Poussey Toutou au Ghana en venant la dernière vague qui est la plus importante qui est la vague Baoulé avec pour meneuse de la lutte la reine Ambla Koko. Donc elle est venue en Côte d'Ivoire avec, ses, avec ses, ses parents proches. Dans la migration, elles ont croisé une rivière, la rivière Omoué. Et de cette rivière, c'était des Akans qui ne savaient pas beaucoup nager. Donc, ils ont demandé à la rivière quelle était la solution appropriée pour traverser. Et parmi eux, il y a un devin qui a dit que la rivière demande, les génies de la rivière demandent qu'on leur fasse une offrande. Cette offrande qui vous est vraiment chère. Eux tous, ils ont fait sortir les parures, les bracelets, les bagues, les... tout ce qu'ils avaient comme objet en nature qu'ils voulaient offrir à la rivière. La rivière les génies de la rivière a dit non, que donnez-nous quelque chose qui vous est encore plus cher. Et le devin a dit, la rivière demande que vous lui offrez le fils que vous portez. Arrivé de l'autre côté de la rive, les poursuivants directs se sont arrêtés quand lorsqu'ils ont vu la rivière, ils ne pouvaient plus partir. Et la reine Abla Poukou a dit à son peuple que l'enfant est mort. Pour dire que nous venons de sacrifier l'enfant pour notre sécurité. Et c'est vraiment triste 
C'est cela que dans, la, dans le système de gestion, depuis le royaume à chanter jusqu'en Côte d'Ivoire, la royauté, on succède au roi de par la position de sa mère. Parce que c'est la mère qui a donné, qui a permis la reine Abla Poukou, qui a donné son fils pour que le peuple soit sauvé. La reine Abla Poukou est, une personnage, est un personnage charismatique chez les Akans, une personne vénérée. Elle représente même l'ardeur, la, la, la ténacité. Cette statue, c'est la statue représentative de la reine Abla Poukou. Tout ce que vous voyez sous cette statue, ce sont les marques identitaires, les marques de rang social. Et la coiffure est une coiffure de rang social assez élevé de cette reine. Back in Ghana at the Akwesidae, the senior women of the Asante royal family are given great prominence and are still vested with considerable power. Nana Rawlings, a former first lady of Ghana, is a close cousin of the current king. I managed to grab a bit of time with her. Asante, um, generally, as an ethnic group, believe in the matrilineal program, matrilineal inheritance. So it goes also with the kingdom and the titancy institution. If you have a child and they're asking you, oh no, what do you have, a boy or a girl? You say a girl, oh, fantastic. The family then becomes bigger because they believe in the matrilineal so much. And everything goes through the, the mothers more than the fathers. Mothers, mothers are important, but not as important as uh, the mothers in the Shanti kingdom. At the Aquasidae, just about everybody is wearing one of the most famous of fabrics in Africa, the Kenti cloth, which literally means whatever happens to it, it will not tear. Kenti cloth, as I discover when I visit a local factory where it's made, is much more than just beautifully designed material. Kenti cloth was originally only worn by Asante royalty. It can be single, double or triple weaved. And traditionally, it was woven only by men. But that's something that has changed in more recent years. And the colour and design of the Kenti cloth denotes status and clan allegiance. Local culture expert Ose Bonsu is again on hand to explain. This is sort of like one of the famous designs that many people are familiar with. Um, what can you tell us about this? Anything yeah, that, special about it? What is special about this one is that kente, as a matter of fact, is very costly. This very one is made in such a way that ordinary people can buy this because it's not that costly. So it is called Makumaso Adie, which means my heart's desire. It was made so that people marrying can buy for their wives. This is a special kind of what Ashanti kings were, a replica of the king's kente called Yokuma. How far does this date back to? It dates back to 1720. Tell us about the gold, because of course, Asante kings have become almost synonymous with gold wearing and the, you know, the lavish costumes that they have. Yes, whatever you see around the king or other chiefs is actually made of gold. All the decorations are of gold. They're not just gold. The things that uh, have been coated with gold have been carved in such a way that they also have meanings and they know uh, when to wear them, which days to wear. It's not every day that you wear all the regalia that you wish to wear. It depends on which situation. When it is celebrating somebody's death, it's all black, red, with gold. But when it is about a day, or very colorful occasion, that is where everything the king wears is took in gold. 
the king has a special artisans because it is not allowed for anybody to copy what a king wears. When the founder of the Asante Kingdom, Ose Tutu I, died after a long reign in 1717, he was succeeded by Opokuware I, who reigned until 1750. He extended the reach of the Asante Kingdom until it covered most of modern Ghana. In 1764, the Asante Hini, Ose Kwadwo I, decided to centralize his kingdom and established a new professional administration based on merit, not birth. This meant that the kingdom was well organized and efficiently run. As a result, the people of Ashantiland lived a comfortable, even prosperous existence, as can be seen in this collection of illustrations by an Italian artist in the 1840s. By the early 19th century, the Asante kings, through their military successes, had accumulated many captives through conquest, some of whom were used as farm laborers. Consequently, food was abundant. The capital Kumasi was well designed with wide streets that were clean and tidy. The palace complex was in the center of the city and houses were comfortable and well built and had toilets that could be flushed. Well, this is a traditional Asante courtyard house, not far from Kumasi, and it dates back to the 19th century. And typically these houses would have a raised ground floor and the pillars would have these um, very attractive carvings made of various materials. The walls were made of mud plastered onto a timber frame with a steeply pitched roof that was covered with thatch. And the walls were painted with a white clay, the upper walls that is, and the lower ones were kind of covered with this terracotta hue. Now, Asante architecture had many different types of models, but they were all inspired by this, the courtyard house. Within the courtyard of grand houses, there would be drums like these in the Palace Museum in Kumasi. These drums, made of wood, silver and animal hide, date back to the late 19th century. The museum curator is Justice Brobby. That's his first name, by the way. He's not a judge. Asante have their own way of communication. They use the local materials, the drums to communicate. You know, the sound of it could travel to the next community and they will act upon the message. Everybody was taught the meaning of the drums. So anytime these were beaten, the people understood and acted upon the message. We call it in our language, a tumpan, that are talking drums. So drums are not only a form of entertainment, but also a means of communication for the Asante, as indeed is the case right across Africa. Culture and power sustained the Asante kingdom and it continued in this vein for some time. However, by the second half of the 19th century, rival Fanti rulers along the coast were increasingly keen to assert themselves and wanted to increase their control of coastal trade. Significantly by now, there was an ever-growing British presence in this part of Africa. Unable to defeat the mighty Asante themselves, the Fanti turned to the British for help. Their interests aligned. The consequences for the Asante were disastrous. In 1874, the British ransacked Kumasi. They took all its treasures, destroyed the king's stone-built palace, and then burnt down the city. The destruction lasted for well over a year. The British declared this part of Africa a crown colony and called it the Gold Coast. But the Asante Kingdom did not perish. In 1888, a new Asantehini took the throne. 
He was Prempe the first, and he decided he wanted to revive and preserve his kingdom. When he was offered protectorate status by the British, he responded. But Prempe knew he could not defeat the British militarily, and he signaled he was prepared to negotiate. The British were in no mood to do so. They did not want to see the re-emergence of a strong Asante kingdom. The story of Prempe I and photos and objects from his reign are on display at the museum in the Manhir Palace in Kumasi. Prempe I, of course, was the Asante king who really came up against the British. How is he regarded in Asante history today? We see him as very um, uh, loyal to the kingdom. When he was installed at age 18, in 1888, because of his age, the British thought that they could manipulate him to their own good. But this king refused. So because of that, this king was deceived and was arrested by the British at age 26. He was sent to Elimina Castle, Cape Coast, for one year. Prempe the first was brought and kept in this room at St. George's Castle in Elmina, about 12 kilometers from Cape Coast. And from here, he was dispatched into exile to the Seychelles. Prempe I was kept in the Seychelles for a quarter of a century. The British built a fort at Kumasi and began to search for the king's golden stool. They knew that if they possessed the sacred object of the Asante, it would deal a decisive and psychological blow to the people and help the British defeat them. In 1900, in one last rearguard attempt to see off the British, the Asante attacked Kumasi Fort. The British were demanding that the golden stool be surrendered, and this culminated in a big battle known as the War of the Golden Stool. King Prempe was in exile and could not rally his troops. So in his place, the elderly Asante Queen Mother, Ya Asantiwa, decided it would be she who led her people into battle. So when the king was arrested and there was no man to fight the British, all the men were afraid. And because nobody was prepared to lead the army, it was this woman, Anaya Santua, at age 65 in 1900, who stood up and said, no way, I'm ready to die for my nation. When the British came to demand for the golden stool of Asante. You know, the golden stool is the symbolic essence of Asante, the pride, the soul, the spirit of Asante. Once the gold stool is missing, that will be the end of the kingdom. So because no man was was ready to fight, this woman volunteered and said, I am ready to die for, uh, for my nation. So she took the gun, fired, and the men had no choice. That was follow her. She was the one who was very instrumental in helping to hide the golden stool away from the British, because that's all they wanted. They wanted that golden stool to take away. And because that was the epitome and the strength of the, 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 the soul of the Ashanti. And they felt that if they took it away, they would be finished. So she helped to hide it in some forest, and then that's why she's so important to us. In the end, despite her best efforts, the Queen Mother and her troops were no match for the British and they were defeated. British officials demanded they be given the golden stool. They did not know the real one had been hidden away and the Asante gave them a fake one. Ya Asantiwa was dispatched to the Seychelles to join the king. 
in 1902, the Gold Coast formally became a British colony. But at least the Asante Kingdom was not destroyed because the British never got their hands on their most valued possession, the Golden Stool. And even in exile, Prempeh I was still revered. How do the Asante people see that aspect of their history? Not really looking at the British at all, mm. but just looking at Prempe and what happened to their, themselves as a people. Here is somebody who has offered himself to be taken away so that the nation would not be destroyed. So, of course, he is a great man. Everybody uh, admires. But the traditions and the heritage all continued, didn't it? Yes, it did. Because when he was away, uh, in the absence of Asantehene, there are others who take control. And all these people were there. But still, it's a hierarchy. When this one is not there, we go to the next in command. When he's not there, we go to the next in command. You couldn't have taken everybody away. So whoever remained still kept the uh, tradition intact. On the day I visit the Aquasidae in Kumasi, Britain's Prince of Wales is attending the ceremony along with his wife, the Duchess of Cornwall. Despite the fact that the Asante were subjugated by the British, there is no lingering resentment and the Ghanaians are happy to welcome the royal couple. At the end of the day, let's iron out our differences and live together. It was the British who built this house for Asante in 1925. When the British had realized that what they did to the king was not good, they brought him back in 1924 and compensated him with this house. But Asante said, no way, we don't want anything cheap. So Asante paid the full cost of it before the king was allowed to move in as his residence. But you've forgiven and forgotten yes. the um, colonial history. It hurts, but Asante people evolved a uniquely successful kingdom of 19th century West Africa. From the area around their capital, Kumasi, they extended their sway to the present day Ghana and their wars of the British brought them fame as a great warrior people. So for the Asante, whose name means because of war, it's better to have fought and lost than to have not fought at all. Prince Charles may represent a country that once ruled the mighty Asante, but today he pays his respects to their paramount king. The Asante show that history and custom are not extinguished by military defeat. And of course, to this day, the Asante people celebrate their traditions and their festivals. In the next episode, we see how Africans responded to the arrival of the Europeans who began to challenge their customs and beliefs, spreading unease across the continent.